I think it's a real pleasure to be here tonight to talk and chat. And uh, there will be time for questions afterwards, or uh, in, in, probably in, in halfway through. Um, I've always been mad keen on aeroplanes. I don't know about you men, but as a boy, when I was about 10 years old, I started to build my own model aeroplanes. Flying models as well as 72nd scale. And uh, one particular model, swept back wing, I had a, a, a principle of size and scale. Whatever the wingspan, one third was the span of the tailplane, and whatever the tailplane was, half the tailplane was the fin and rudder. And I worked to that as my basic design uh, on flying models. Uh, with slight and with with fore and aft uh, dihedral and and di normal uh, uh, lateral dihedral, rubber driven when I was ten eleven years old, and one particular model, caught a thermal, at Leicester, the city of Leicester, where I was flying it uh, in the in the club fields, at ten or eleven years of age, disappeared from view in a thermal. I made a folding propeller that was one bladed with a counterweight so that it would form itself into a glider. <coughs> Caught a thermal and I got a, and I used to paste on my name and address and I got, didn't always get one back, seldom, but on this occasion I got one back and it had landed at Stanford Hall in Northamptonshire and it was at the base of a statue to a man called Percy Pilcher who was one of the first powered aircraft pilots in this country to fly. And wasn't that amazing? And I cycled all the way down and fetched it back. <laughs> I joined the RAF at the age of 17 and a half, but uh, the, I wanted to be um, a fighter pilot if I could. And uh, I expressed uh, at the selection board a, 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 a desire to do so. And I got put on de deferred service, which in water, which was wartime. Uh, this was in 1942, or thereabouts. I can't remember if it's 42, 43, or 44 these days. But um, I was put on to def deferred service, and I wrote a letter every week asking me, please call me up. <laughs> it's daft, isn't it? It's just daft. And uh, I just wanted to get in because of Building the models as I did, I, I was in the Royal, Royal Observer Court as well, and I could start and name the airplanes, uh, aircraft recognition, and I've done time doing so. And I saw the first uh, bombers in the Midlands, the German bombers in wartime came over, and I saw a Heinkel 111 in a searchlight over, over, over Leicester itself, caught in a searchlight, and I recognised the Heinkel 111 at, at that age. So I, I just loved aeroplanes, and uh, it, it was like all boys of my age at the time, I think. Sir Alan Cobham and people that, you know, you've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Johnson, uh, I went to uh, the, the airfield where she took off from to fly to Australia. And uh, yes, I remember all that sort of thing. Anyway, they did call me up eventually, thank goodness. And I went to the Heaton Park in... Uh, well, not Heaton Park, Lord's Cricket Ground, actually, is where, they, where we were, all went to a reception centre there. And I did all the initial uh, tests and uh, got through the initial things. I'd done the test before I joined anyway. And went to an initial training wing in Torquay. And there, for three months, studied all the navigation under a scheme which was called the Pilot Navigator Bomb Aimer Scheme, PNB. And uh, it was simply, you were taken in as a pilot, and then if you passed the flying exams later on, uh, you, you were selected as a pilot. If you didn't and done well in ground school on navigation, you would go as a navigator, or bomb aimer, or air gunner. And I, I did three months at Torquay in initial training wing, and uh, it was there that I kicked my heels for about another three months, waiting for a posting to what was called a grading school. And the grading school was at Thiel, near Reading, T-H-E-A-L-E. -E. And what it was, a tiger moth, 
and you went up with an instructor as I did and after seven hours we'd done all the loops and rolls, stall turns, uh, emergency landings and of course takeoffs and landings. He got out and said off you go, you're on your own. And I soloed, I think it was at seven and a half hours. That did it. I'm in. Wings. I'm going forward and I've passed the initial thing. Then off I went to ground school with the remnant because we lost a few at that stage. Uh, uh, I went to ground school at Torquay and uh, did all the navigation and stuff like that and uh, I got through that. And then kicked my heels again because there was a big waiting list to go on to further training, operate, uh, what, what was called, uh, well, normal pilot training in my case, but you, you went off to, to grading school where you flew a tiger moth. All aircrew were, were, were graded after that. If you did all right flying the tiger moss, you went on a, for pilot training, or you went to navigation training if you did well at ground school, etc., etc. I went out to Canada to train as a pilot, and I trained on American Harvards, and uh, but initially Canadian-built tiger moths, identical to the ones here, except that they had heating in the ca cabin, not an open cockpit and uh, brake wheels, br left and right uh, steering on the wheels, brakes on the wheels, heating, really super jobs. And uh, that's where I did my uh, first elementary flying training. I passed that all right, went on to, to uh, uh, advanced training on Harvard as uh, fighters and fi dive fighter bomber. I was asked what I wanted to do, and I, I said I, I wanted to be a fighter pilot, and I'll tell you why. I was seated in the local cinema in wartime, watching the news or something, and uh, as the lights, as my eyesight got used to the dim, dim lighting, I noticed that sitting next to me was an, was a, an airman, an RAF airman, and would you believe it? He'd got pilot wings on his chest, like I've got. And he'd got his rank on. He was a sergeant pilot. 1940. I, I, that, that did it. I really, I was so enthusiastic. I just wanted to fly. And in Canada, I got started on Harvard's because of my experience at grading school. Apparently, I, I got through. It was up in... I don't know whether you know this, but you know we all watched in those days, and probably still do, Cowboys and Indians. Well, actually, the Indians, and the, the Indians were mostly local Indians, as we call them, in Canada. Most of what you see in, in horse riding, pony Indian, with their fighting daggers and things and, and spears and so on, they weren't in America at all. They were in what is now what became Canada, and a lot of the names of places in Canada are, are actually French because the French came out to Canada, if you remember from your schoolboy days and schoolgirl days, uh, that, that that they had cowboys and Indians, and all the Indians were the bad ones, and they were all actually in the south, but they weren't. There's places like Assiniboia, Indian name. Medicine Hat, Indian name. Calgary, in Indian name. Winnipeg, Indian name. I could go on. I can't actually. <laughs> I've forgotten it. But there's, lo there's lots of them. As you go across Canada, and we had a wonderful time when we went out there. This is all free, by the way. I'm now in the Air Force. And so I'm, I've got the flash in my cap. That's the, the cadet and I've got the, flat, the white belt and the rest of it, and, and this is wonderful stuff. And all the Canadian people were just wonderful hospitality. There was a list in the... I wasn't, I wasn't an, an, a, a, a sergeant then, I was an airman, of course, a cadet. And there was a list in our, our canteen of people who were volunteering to accept us in, for an, a, a, a weekend entertainment at Christmas. 
I went to, I, I had Christmas out there and I spent Christmas with a Canadian family. And they had presents on their Christmas tree for me. They were just wonderful. And it was, it was like being on holiday, really. Doing what I like to do, flying, being entertained, free of charge, hospitality, well fed when rationing was on here, and no blackout. And it was fully blacked out here. You would not believe it. It was a long holiday. And uh, not only that, but I actually went over on the QE, Queen Elizabeth. And when we, uh, half, of the, half of us that went out there went north to Canada and half went south down to, uh, down to Pensacola to train. We went to Canada to train. And uh, it, it, the weather was cold. The climate was hot in the summer, terribly hot in the summer, 40 above. And in the winter, 40 below. <laughs> well, it, sound, it seemed like it. And uh, I did my service flying training in the Harvard. This is a Harvard here. There's, a, there's, a, there's one of them. In Harvard. fact, there's more than one. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a Texans, actually. This is a Harvard. That's the Harvard. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a lovely aeroplane. You see how the shape of it and the, and the, 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 the appearance of being a fighter in, in, the per, in the curve of pursuit. A curve of pursuit, if there's a plane coming towards me in this direction, and I'm up there in that direction, then I, I dive down and go into a curve, and because I'm diving, I catch up speed. My speed enables sufficient speed to overtake when I get down there, throttle back, and I'm on his tail. So it's known as a curve of pursuit. And that is a beautiful aeroplane, and I still think it is. Yes. And there's one here at Staverton, and they keep saying, I can have a flight in it if I want, and I've not got around to it yet. <laughs> I will do eventually. Anyway, let's get down to business now. We also had uh, live firing, not at the target aeroplane, but at a drogue tow behind it. And we had a bombing range uh, south of, the, of Calgary itself, I went right across Canada. I went over in the QE, as I said, disembarked at New York. There was a band on the key, at, uh, key. Here's, the, here's, the, here's the British boys arriving. The British boys are here, look, look. And the band was playing Yankee Doodle Dandy. The, the QE literally leaned over a little bit. <laughs> Everybody rushed to that side. Big ship, and it, it just it <laughs> felt that it had leaned over. And then we were taken to uh, Grand Central Station, private train, restaurant car, sleepers on board, first class accommodation, and first class food, and sightseeing to go with it. New York, right up the East Coast, to, uh, near to Halifax, a place called Moncton in Canada, waiting again. Weeks, I spent perhaps six, eight weeks at Moncton waiting, whether we were going down to Canada or whether we were going to, to uh, uh, down to America or going to Canada. There was what's called, and wait for this, the Empire Training Scheme. <laughs> Canada being in the Empire and South Africa was in the Empire, so there was a training scheme in South Africa there was a training scheme in Canada, and the Americans were helping us out, as they always do, by also providing training at Pensacola, in, in, down in, in, in mid-America, Midwest. And I went across Canada, having got to Moncton, waited some weeks, posted to Winnipeg, well, a place called Nipawa. There's an Indian name, Nipawa. <coughs> And that was Tiger Moss, and, and it was another special train. Started from the East Coast, went right past the lakes, Great Lakes, Lake, Lake, Lake Ontario and Lake Superior. It was March, April time. The weather was lovely. It was like being on holiday again. It was all holiday. And, and restaurant cars, sleeping cars on board. Seven nights on this train, chugging across to Winnipeg, 
from where we went up to a place called Nipua, where there was a, a flying training airfield. And they had Canadian air, uh, tiger moths. <coughs> Not the same as our tiger moths. They, they were the same, but see, I'm contradicting myself. They look the same, but they differ in some respect, and that is comfort. Ours in this country, they were just wide open cockpits. In their country, they had a sliding canopy, internal heating, air conditioned, and power assisted brakes. In other words, when you put your foot on the brake and were, the brakes were in the, in the rudder pedals, you not only steered it with your rudder pedals on the ground, but you also applied the right brake with the right leg and the left brake with the left leg, or between them as the pressure applied. So you could steer them by your brakes on the ground as well. Very useful in a crosswind. And I got through that and went on to service flying training on the Harvard. There were bomb racks under the wings. There was a, a camera guns in each wing to represent the machine guns of a fighter. And when you press, press the fighter button on the control stick, it operated the camera and that took photographs of what you were actually doing with the gun sight, which was superimposed in the camera. So you could go into the classroom when you got back and you could show the films of your flight and you could show the films of how you got on, how good you were aiming off, whether you were in the right, whether you were going to hit the target at all, never mind about aiming off or getting the right range. And of course, we had in the gun sight in those days, we had wire gun sights and circular. And as you got nearer to the target, of course, it got bigger in the, in the view. This thing didn't get bigger, but the, 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 the aircraft got bigger in the view and the wingspan showed you within circles inside the, the, the camera that was actually a camera as well as being a, what you could see. Uh, you could judge, therefore, the distance between the fighter and the target. And that meant that you could open, at, open fire at the best effective range for the ammunition that you were carrying. And we fired live ammunition at drogues towed behind towing aircraft. And I got through that. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. And uh, the uh, passing out parade was in a hangar because it was 40 below. It was January time. Incidentally, the runways were marked out with branches down the side of the runway. We, didn't, we never saw the runway for about two months when I first went there at, N at Nipoar. And we, we, we had the passing out parade and the, 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 the idea there was you were now going to be get presented with your pilot's badge, the wings, and you were automatically going to become a sergeant pilot. Would you believe it that I'm going to be a sergeant pilot, the same as this guy that was sitting next to me in the cinema when I was, te whatever age I was. And uh, he came along and there was a photographer with him. Got one here today, look. And he was taking, taking photographs. And what happened? Four didn't come out. And I was one of them. Yeah. Everybody else got their photograph of the Air Officer Commanding Royal Canadian Air Force pinning the wings on, on our tunics. I got them pinned on all right, but I didn't get a picture of it. But I put them on today but they're not actually full size, and neither are the metals. They're, they're miniatures. I thought I'd pay you respects. Then I've not put them on for my own pleasure or enjoyment. I've put them on just to let you see that, <laughs> what they look like. Came back on a French boat. They still mention it occasionally on, on, the, on the television. The Louis Pasteur. And it was, a, it was a cruise liner before the war, or between the two great wars. And it had been stripped right out. And when we went out on the QE, as we went up the, uh, the gangway, there was a, a sergeant at the top, and we were cadets, remember, and we were walking up with all our kit on our backs, big pack and carrying whatever we could or whatever we needed. Whatever we wanted was with us. It wasn't anywhere else. We took it with us and carried it. And as we got to the top, going out, top of the loading, it tapped on the shoulder, C, D, E, this is the, de the decks, 
in the Queen Elizabeth. And I got F. I won't mention... <laughs> I got F. Right at the F bottom. <laughs> and there we, we had hangers, we had hammocks slung between the metal beams. And we slept in the hammocks and we spent the entire journey from Greenock to New York in that deck in case the boat was torpedoed, in case the ship, I shouldn't call it a boat, in, close, in case the ship was torpedoed, so that we could manually wind together, the water, wind the water, watertight guard, doors together if the electrics failed. That was my happy holiday going out. Coming back was different. Coming back, we were now sergeant pilots and we had accommodation in a cabin and good food. And it was, it was like going on holiday because not only did they zigzag, all shipping going across the Atlantic in the war zigzagged. Now, the QE wasn't accompanied by the Navy, the Navy, it went unaccompanied across the Atlantic. But it did a zigzag within, within a zigzag. So it was going port and port turning, starboard and starboard turning, all the way across the Atlantic. It takes about three times as long as it should do, but at least you know you're going to get there. And many of them didn't, of course. The submarine packs were just off Northern Ireland and going out into the Atlantic and coming back just off New York and South. So we, we zigzagged and we, we had, a, we had a, a rough time going out because I spent my time, as did several others, down in the lower decks and sleeping and that's where we did. I managed to get up on one occasion to look at the, back, look at the sea from the, the back of the, the boat. And I got back home, coming back, zigzagging, right down to the Azores and on the Louis Pasteur, but this time in cabins and not in hammocks. We lost a lot of air crew as well as troops and uh, there was at the time that I'm now going to talk about before D-Day and we lost a lot at D-Day. Uh, but later on, advancing through Europe, uh, of course, if you remember, we, well, you may not, but uh, we sort of swung to the left, went towards Paris, swung to the left, went up towards the German frontier. The Germans were in occupation of France, of course, right the way down to Alsace and to, to the river and the Moselle. And we, we swung left and went up towards Bremen in that direction to what is known as the Schleswig Peninsula, Schleswig-Holstein. And uh, there's a, a large plain area, the Hanoverian plain, and then there's the, the Ruhr. And running from the coast of the North Sea uh, in Holland, right the way down to Switzerland, actually it flows the other way. It starts in Switzerland, up in the hills, or the mountains, and flows through uh, a place called uh, uh, s southern Germany, where it's uh, Rheinfalden, where the Rhine Falls are. And the Rhine runs then northwards and goes all the way up and then swings life, the Ruhr on the right, the, the uh, heavy plants and the Ruhr on the right, the, Mo the River Moselle coming in from Luxembourg on the left, swings around and enters the North Sea just north of Nijmegen and Ray Margan. And uh, it's, a, it's a barrier. It's been there a long time. It's still there. I've been there quite a bit. And it's a beautiful river. But it's also a wide river and it's a very difficult river to cross. And so armies get held up. You may have heard of the Battle of the Bulge. Well, you're just about going to hear anyway. <laughs> the, the thing is that the, the southern area of Germany 
front, the Mo River Moselle flows into, the, into Germany uh, at a place called Koblenz and then it goes through a, a wide gorge. <coughs> All that area to the, to the other side of the Rhine there was Germany and this side of the Rhine in Alsace, which was French, was occupied by the Germans, of course, and, and right the way through to the coast at uh, Calais. And uh, in wartime, the, the, the whole process there was that we bombed it a lot. And so when it came to the Christmas prior to, in 1944, there'd been this period of stagnation and things going on in North Africa. Hitler had been messing about all over the place. Mussolini had been making a bit of a nuisance of himself as well. And we'd got our backs to the wall. But we began to overcome it and then Hitler had another go in, and thrust suddenly out of the blue right up through from Luxembourg up into France and a great big battle f was fought called the Battle of the Bulge. He made this tremendous entry into France under the underbelly of Europe. Instead of going up round the top end and coming in into the North Sea, he was going to go through uh, to, to, to uh, right the way through to, to Paris, uh, but, and, and however, we stopped him, didn't we? We, sh we showed him a thing or two, and we pushed him back, and we got, his, we got his back to the wall, and the wall was, of course, the river. But we'd got now the wall in front of us, and we'd got rid of the, the bulge, that we had uh, around Christmas time and springtime or whatever it was, and uh, we wanted to counterattack. Now, when you're going to counterattack with an army, no mind about anything else, an army as such, with the, t the generals that we had in charge, of whom you, you know most of them, I think, Patton was one, and another one was uh, Eisenhower, and another one was, was our own, and I can't think of his name now. Montgomery. Montgomery, well done. And apart from the fact that they'd all been having a go, we were held up. We'd got, got rid of the, the counter-offensive that had come in through Luxembourg, from Luxembourg over the river Moselle in the southern, southern Alsace region of France, and we'd, we'd, we'd push them back. And uh, we'd push them back over the Rhine. Now then, to defend the Rhine, if you're on the other side, where do you put your defences? Are you going to put them, and it's a long river, you know, it's 300 miles, it comes in at, uh, at uh, Rheinfelden in the south, goes right the way through to through Koblenz, with, and then up to Hamburg on the right, and, and Schleswig-Holstein Peninsula sw swings left and out in, and into the North Sea. It's a long river, and it's a wide river, and it's very difficult to, fro to cross it with an army, unless you've got some possession on the other side to help you with the, with the crossing, to keep their heads down, to do it with. And we had a bit of a, we had a, bit of a, a silent time. Of course, we were being bombed from the air. And I remember seeing a Heinkel 111 go over the city of Leicester, I think I mentioned it. Uh, a searchlight caught it in, in the beam and I, I spotted it. And as I studied and joined the Royal Observer Corps as a young man, I, I knew instantly what it was. And I also saw a Heinkel 111 come out of the cloud cover over Leicester in daylight, broad daylight. He didn't know where he was, did he? He did, he did a circle to have a look. And it's useful, there's a railway junction, there's roads. If you want to fight with an army across a large obstacle, you've got to have cover against the air. You've got to cover yourself against the enemy's attacks from the air. You've also got to look at the obstacles in front of you. And because if you do that, you know more or less where's the enemy going to be? Where are they going to be concentrating their defences? Well, if they've got any sense, they'll be, they'll be concentrating them at certain vulnerable points of railway junctions, road junctions, etc. And they'll be mobile. And you don't know exactly where they're going to be. So they didn't know either where we would come one day, as we did, and we were getting pretty close to it, to getting into Germany itself. And that meant getting across the Rhine. 
Now, it would have been disastrous if Hitler and his lousy gang had found any indications of where we were about to cross. So the last thing you want to do is to give any indication of where you're going to cross. And so you put in diversionary attacks. And these diversionary attacks just go on all the way up from the north down to the south, but not getting across the river. And on top of that, you shoot up the airfields or you bomb the airfields the other side. You put the airfields out of, a, out of, out of a line uh, and if you, if you concentrate on one area and say, right, we'll, we'll bomb, let's bomb Koblenz and all that, then Hitler's going to say, ah, that's where they're going to cross. You'd give the game away. So the last thing that we wanted to do with all this build-up of arms and ammunition that we were doing in this country and on, on the continent after we'd got into France, we wanted to conceal from Hitler so that we could get over the other side without him knowing exactly where we were to come, where we were coming from, and take him by surprise. And we jolly well did, because we did what was known as Operation Varsity, the crossing of the Rhine. It was the largest airborne operation to this day of combined operation of air and land, where the land and air is neutralizing the enemy, not only to the front, but to the flanks. And the way the concentration of effort to get in against him isn't just to Berlin or Munich or Nuremberg or anywhere else, but he doesn't know where you're coming unless you give the game away. So you, you mustn't give the game away. When we were going across the channel, we concealed everything before we did our D-Day landings. When we were going to cross the Rhine, we concealed all the build-up that went on on the west side of the Rhine. And when we went over, we had to make sure that when we got the other side, that we could get an area of land, capture it, hold it, d defend it against the German counterattacks when he swings his forces back from the south and brings them down from the north by the forces we've got behind us. And that was Operation Varsity and it took place on March the 24th, 1945. The reason I volunteered for it was that I was trained as a fighter pilot. And of course, we had been suffering extremely heavy casualties in the build-up for the, for the D-Day and all the rest of it. Bomber Command was took very heavy casualties in Bomber Command, and that called for pilots that were trained, multi-engine trained. So anybody that comes back skilled and trained as single fighter pilots, that was based on and budgeted for according to the casualties we had at the Battle of Britain. That was in the past. Now we've got another battle, we've got too many fighter pilots trained, and we wanted bomber pilots. And we couldn't, we, we trained them as fast as we could, but because we lost a lot, we trained a lot. And so when volunteers were called for for uh, the glider pilot regiment, this happened at a time when we had put down the first attempted crossing of the Rhine, which was at Arnhem. It would have saved all of the problem of the wide open plains, of the gorge, there is a, a, a gorge called the Rhine Gorge, saved all the battle that would have taken place there if we'd got in at Arnhem, but we didn't. Hitler did exactly the same thing that we were doing, it had mobile forces ready. And we went in on three lifts. It, it, it spread over a week. And by the time lift one goes in, 100, let's, let's take a unit of 100, let's say 100 light tanks. It takes another 200 to, to get there. And they're eight miles away. They're in a, a waiting area. They've got to get up to the Rhine and get across the Rhine. And he's doing the same thing the other side. By the time you get there, there's more build-up against you. They've got more opposition against you than when you started. And we had to withdraw from Ar Arnhem pretty quick because we took such a heavy casualty rate and they got, they got the uh, reinforcements in in time. It didn't matter other, other than what it did for morale and what it did for the loss in, involved, which was sad. And actually, uh, I have been there myself to Nijmegen to have a look at the cemetery there for another reason. I um, 
volunteered to fly gliders when they were called for from the RAF because there's a surplus of fighter single tra engine trained and I, I wouldn't get into bomber command I'd, I'd have to I'd have to do about six months conversion training I wanted to get in on the act I didn't want to sit on my tire on backside at somewhere in comfort in sergeant's mess somewhere and whilst people were fighting away at D-Day on the on D-Day itself I was doing PT on the beach uh, with, at uh, Whitley Bay near Newcastle where about 50 or 60 of us, all sergeant pilots, were being kept busy and fit and just doing it, uh, clambering over the moors of Northumberland. Frustrating. So I volunteered to get in on the act and off I went and I trained to fly military gliders. The first one was the hot spur that I learned to fly. It carried about eight men, and it was really an ad adaption of a, of a sailplane. It wasn't really a military glider. You, you know, eight men is neither one thing or another. It's not a section even of, of, the, of, the, of the infantry. Uh, and uh, the next one, there was Americans on Lee's Lend and sent us their, hadri their wackos over, uh, which were very useful. They were a metal-framed glider. We called them the Hadrian covered in canvas, but they, they carried, whereas the hot spur just carried eight or so men, it, you couldn't get a jeep in it or anything like that. The wacko, you could get a jeep in it, just a jeep. And we had some wackos that they'd given us on Leaseland, and then we called, we called for volunteers to form a huge force of gliders and paratroopers, parachute training. We'd done several trials, if you had rehearsals for this, live rehearsals. Some of the things that took place on the French coast uh, were, were rehearsals, really. They were, they were not really battles. However, the, the, the thing was that we, we've got now out of balance. We're replacing the, the uh, fighters or the crews to fly the fighters, and we're not losing them. We're free, we need them for the bombers, and that means another conversion course. And there's a big queue again. And off I went and flew the Hotspur, and, and then the Hadrian. And then the military glider, the Horsa. There's another one as well <laughs> called the, uh, the uh, Hamilcar. Hamilcar. Yeah, and uh, I didn't like the, I didn't like the Hamilcar. I never flew it but I didn't like the looks of it either. I'll tell you what, I didn't fancy having a seven-ton tank, tank underneath me <laughs> when it tips over on its nose. <laughs> and the two pilots sat on the top yeah. in a cabin yeah. with the horse at your front end, and you, you see what's going on. And I trained, I met up at a, a conversion unit to, to, to uh, I qualified as a pilot, of course, in Canada, and I, I flew, a, flew, we flew, flew through Tiger Moss to keep our hands in. That was just keeping us busy. Um, in places like uh, Booker at High Wycombe, we went there to do it. Just, we were literally given the use of a, of a Tiger Moth individually, just to fly for a couple of hours. It, it wouldn't last longer than that on a fill up of petrol. And, and uh, then fill up again and have another trip on our own, filling in time for some weeks. And I got trained after that as a glider pilot trained on the Horsa. It's an aeroplane. People often say to me, why, why, why a glider? Well, the reason is it's produced, mass produced in sections at various factories dispersed throughout the country. That preserves it, protects it against mass bombing, bombing by the Germans. Don't forget the Germans were bombing us and they're trying to bomb the, the industrial areas and the factories, and therefore dispersal, dispersal of production was a great thing in wartime. And the horse was built in sections and assembled at places in the south of England and elsewhere, and they were built here in, in Cheltenham. The nose of, a gloss, of the horses were built here, for instance. Um, so the, the war progressed at that stage uh, as a sort of stalemate. Um, the Germans had been pushed back over the Rhine. We were reconsolidating reconsol in the west, filling up our, uh, building up our invasion force on the south, concealing it from the, their invaders. I actually saw 
when I was at the initial training in Torquay, uh, I actually saw a German Fock Wolf 190, which is a fighter, come over the sea at Torquay, at sea level, swoop up over the cliffs of, of, uh, of Torquay itself and, and head off and uh, fire a few rounds and then obviously photographing all round, having a look-see. And the, the worst thing that could have happened for us was for them to see the build-up of the, the tanks and, uh, and forces that we were doing. The 10,000 American troops that had come over, the, the, the huge numbers of aeroplanes and, and other transport that was being transported and used in the, in the build-up area in the south of England. And we did it. We, cons we fooled him. We fooled them. We, they really did. They didn't see it. They didn't see it happening. They began to think we were going through Gibraltar and, and, and that sort of thing. And they were wrong. So D-Day came and we were successful. It was a bit of a, 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 bit of a tug of war initially. We, we gave a bit and we took a bit. And we got into a form of stalemate in the spring and October, well, in the autumn of 44. And it was then that uh, the production of the military gliders was stepped up. Because you can tow a glider and you can write it off. You just leave it. It's finished. With a powered aircraft, you can bring it back and use it again. And you can tow the glider with a powered aircraft, so you get four times the utilisation if you get four flights out of it that you wouldn't get if you were using powered aircraft. And so the idea was that we would use a, a great force of gliders which could carry tanks, as indeed the large glider, the Hamilcar could, a seven-ton tank, and the three and a half ton, seven tons in a Hamilcar, three and a half tons in a Horsa. A Horsa would, would take a, a jeep as I did. So I went to, to train for, for the army, as it were, and I, I didn't keep my red berry. I wore a red berry in, in, uh, when I was in the, in, in the Army Air Corps, in the Glider Pilot Regiment. And I, I didn't keep one as a souvenir. And I, I, I often regret it, really. I've, I've got pilot's wings and things like that that I've kept. But it was wartime, and, and we weren't allowed to take photographs in, at all. We'd, we were absolutely forbidden. And we knew that something was going on because we were, we were busy fetching new gliders. I, I met a chap, my co-pilot, uh, called Bob Shepherd, a Scot. I had a great affinity with the Scots in wartime. I had a great friend in initial training when I was at Torquay, a chap called Anderson. And uh, he was subsequently killed in Canada on, a, on training as a pilot out there in a flying accident. Bob Shepherd was... was uh, a bit younger than me and came into the Air Force later than me, but he was a sergeant pilot and he came to me as a co-pilot. And I got him here at Fairford, where I was stationed. And I was stationed at Fairford to convert to horses, having done all the others. <coughs> they had Albemarle's towing us at, uh, at uh, Fairford, but I towed mostly behind the Stirling or uh, other, other twin-engined aeroplanes. And Bob joined me there, and we crewed together and flew together, and we had great fun together as well. And, uh, and we didn't know what was going to happen, but we trained on the Salisbury Plain with the army, and we did all the usual things. We'd got to fight when we're on the ground. We're going to be fighting troops as well, so we, we learnt all the skills of rifles and machine guns and pistols and mortars, 4.2-inch mortars, 2-inch mortars as well. And, and all the, the skills of a, of a soldier, as well as the skills of a pilot and of aircrew. And then we got the great day. It was March the 23rd, was a, a Friday, and we were called to a briefing on the Friday night. And it was there that we got our crew state, the very last moment before an operation the next day, which we were then briefed on. And I got a, a chap, an army staff sergeant that I had been crewed up with. Now, he was a man who had done North Africa. He had landed gliders in North Africa. He had landed a glider in Crete. He had landed at D-Day. And I thought, this is good enough for me. <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a survival rate here. He was the first pilot. Now, as a condition 
of volunteering as a first pilot, we were told and guaranteed that all of our flying hours would be uh, bookable and recorded as first pilot, wherever we sat in the, in the glider. So I, I can't lose. I uh, can't lose on this. So I, I, Bob joined me. We did the training together. And uh, the night before the op, he, he's not coming with me. He's going with an army chap. And I'm going with an army staff sergeant, the same rank as me. And the reason was that in my glider, we were carrying not just the jeep, and uh, not yes, jeep and trailer, but 220 rounds of two-inch mortar bomb ammunition and the mortars to go with it and the mortar crew to go with it and the captain of the crew, so 12, 12 soldiers, and, 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 and that's the last I ever saw of Bob. <laughs> he was unfortunately killed on the op and I never saw him again and it was very sad. And we just carried on. But anyway, the, the, the day of the op, Operation Varsity, you will see photographs of planes lined up alongside the runways, a, a sort of zigzag shape. I think we've got one photograph I've seen going through on the screen, actually. And uh, that, was, that, was, that was pretty valuable. Um, the, there's a reason for it. You start off with the gliders lined round the perimeter. You know in an airfield you've got a perimeter track going right round it, and then you've got runways in the sh shape of a triangle. The main runway is the prevailing wind normally. So you line up the perimeter track all the way round to the beginning of the runway with the powered aircraft, and you line up the gliders on the other side of the airfield round the perimeter track, and they're all lined up in sequence according to the loads that they're carrying in the gliders and the, 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 uh, and the ones you want first before the others because they'll be getting there first. And as you get <coughs> prepared to go and take off, the, t the airplane tug, which I call it, which in my case was a Sterling, taxis onto the runway and some men run out and a jeep comes and taxis up, a tow, tow vehicle comes and, ta and, and couples up to the glider pulls the glider onto the runway, lines it up, and men come out and plug in the glider and plug in the, the tug, all within 60 seconds. The tugs round the other side have got their engines ticking over, and we all get into the air, and I think on our, I took off from Shepherd's Grove in Norfolk. Uh, <clears throat> I did my training here in Gloucestershire. I flew over Gloucester, in a glider on tow, and Cheltenham. I mentioned Cheltenham just as a matter of, uh, no, an offshore, <laughs> offshore. Uh, Gloucester comes first, I think. But, uh, well, we, we reached Gloucester first. It's easy to recognise Gloucester from the air as well as from the ground <laughs> for a variety of reasons. <laughs> and then off we went. We got off safely. I saw the wheel marks of one of the Stirlings in front of me in the top of the trees at the end of the runway. <laughs> and they didn't get off. No, they crashed. And so did the glider, I think. We didn't know. We lost eight gliders altogether before we arrived, before it even started, as it were, the other end. Several in the sea, in the channel. And we formed a stream from Lincoln because it had a, a very re recognisable landmark, the cathedral. And we flew due south down to Hawkinge in Kent. And we crossed the channel at Hawkinge and joined the uh, other side of, of, the, of the channel, dead in line with Brussels. In, in other words, over Brussels, not going through Brussels itself, flying over Brussels towards the Rhine uh, more or less north of Cologne. And uh, at, we were going to an area called Vesel. The, the river, there's a little stream flows into the Rhine called the Isis. I-S-I-S. -S. It's, it's still on maps. And it, it was called the Isis. It sounds strange these days. 
it hasn't do, it doesn't have a, a Muslim interpretation. <laughs> and uh, we, we, this was this was the way we were going. And uh, we were going the next morning at the briefing. And I'm told Bob, I'm saying cheerio to Bob. And we all go to bed, get about four hours, five hours sleep. And <clears throat> we get an early call the following morning, drive out in uh, a jeep. We all had jeeps, as it were, but we, the, the, the back, the, there was a, a brigade called the Air Landing Brigade that actually loaded the gliders. We didn't do them. I didn't have any bother about the loading of the gliders. These were professional guys who had been trained and had already done about three or four operations throughout Europe or wherever. So we'd get there and the load was already in the glider. So the gliders were lined up. We drive out and we clam climb it, clamber into our glider. There's and myself. It doesn't matter who is the first pilot in my case. I'm going to book first pilot flying times anyway. And so I didn't mind. It didn't matter to me who sat in which seat. It became very important to some fellows. And it, it did a little bit of edge, you know, a little bit of regret crept in. It was a shame, really, but it didn't with us. Uh, we were a great team. And uh, we started to, uh, we got out of our jeeps, got into the glider, and the, everybody's in it. <coughs> and there's not, there's not a sound. You know, there's, there's no conversation. It's not how are you today or anything like that. What do you think? Where, where do you think we go? They all knew where they were going. We weren't allowed to take cameras or anything that would give us an ident give identification, any of us. And we've, we were dressed in all the gear of, of the paratroops, the same as the paratroop division, uh, as, uh, uh, with all the, the kit and the camouflage and the steel helmet and everything. And so we weren't... We, we didn't want to be different to the, on the ground. We didn't want to be able to recognize pilots different to the soldiers. So, okay, we're, we're lined up and the, the going off in front of us. I, I was about um, 12th back, I think. We had two squadrons here at Fairford. Uh, uh, sorry, not here, at Shepherd's Grove in Norfolk. I'm talking about now where the operational squadron was, where I formed up with, with Bob. And uh, we, we, we get away very, very quickly. It was a gorgeous morning. It was a similar, a similar weather to what it is today. Although it was crisp and cold-ish, it was bright and beautiful sunshine. And we flew in a stream and it was a wonderful sight. We couldn't see the beginning of it where we were. We joined it at uh, Lincoln and we were already half of the way, well, three quarters of the way there where we started from at Shepherd's Grove in Norfolk. But other planes were coming in, tugs were coming in, combinations were coming in from, all, from here and from other airfields around here as well as other, elsewhere, forming up at Lincoln over beacons and other means uh, on time and forming two streams. And this stream was absolutely covering as far as the eye could see in front of, in front of us. Couldn't see behind us, of course, from the cabin. A bit too busy watching the tug in front. Not simple flying a glider. It's, it's particularly fully loaded because you've got the, you've got the downdraft. It, it depends which position you're in. If you're in the high toe, uh, higher than the toe, the toe that's towing you, that's one thing, the, the, the draft of the, the propellers is pushing the stream back like that. If you're in the low tow, you've got the, dry, you've got the turbulence of the, the tug, four engines. But uh, never mind, it didn't matter. We towed in the high tow. And <clears throat> we towed in two streams. And that was the sight. And people in, in Norfolk and Suffolk and Essex and all the way down to Hawkins must have seen this lot going over. I don't know whether they would be cheering or what they would be doing. You couldn't hear them in the glider anyway. There wasn't a word said behind us. There was no conversation at all. <laughs> I thought to myself, what on earth are they thinking, these chaps? They'd got no parachutes. They'd got their kit and, they were, and they'd got it on, all ready to go. And they were totally reliant on a glider made of wood and canvas and two RAF pilots, not even squaddies. 
Well, we were because we landed it. However, as we got over, just as we were approaching the Rhine, having left Brussels, we could see it in the far distance. It was a lovely clear morning and the sun was rising on the east and it was reflecting in the river. And because the river is not a straight river, this created a sort of flashing effect. So you're, you're flying into the sun and it's, it's sort of signaling to you. It's almost Morse code as much as to say, welcome. And you could see it from uh, perhaps 50 miles away. We were at two and a half thousand feet and all, all around us and behind us are, the, are these other, uh, in front of us, there was, uh, there was Hamilcar squadron. <clears throat> now Hamilcar is, is a huge glider or was, as I think I said, carried seven tons, a seven ton tank. Our maximum load was three and a half tons, which worked out at a, a jeep and trailer fully loaded and, and a captain of the Oxford and Bucks Light Infantry and a warrant officer and 12 troops and ourselves. <clears throat> and this was a magnificent sight. And anybody on the ground at that day, and I, I've never met anybody, never heard anybody tell the story either, but they must have seen that sight and thought, wow, this is it. And that's the way I felt too. This is it, at least we're getting, we're going to do something now, we're not sitting about anymore. And we crossed the coast. And as we were crossing the coast, on our left side, port side, I saw a street go up. And it was a V2 rocket being launched. And all you could see was the streak. And I said to Bob, well, at least we're going to be doing something. I hope to stop that shortly. Because they were bombing London with rockets in daylight uh, the day we left. And we saw they didn't hit any of us because they were up in North, Hol North Holland they were launching them from. As we got towards the Rhine, it was a beautiful sight. It was, I keep saying on holiday, it was like being on holiday. It was really enjoyable. And uh, it, it, was, it was comforting to know that we were doing something at long last, worthwhile. And in front of us, it just looked like bonfire night. I can't think of any other explanation. The sky was full of smoke in which there were flashes going as we were getting to it. And the stream was entering it and as they got into it you couldn't see them. And we saw this from a distance. I mean when you're at the nose of a glider you can see miles ahead. <coughs> and uh, we'd lost apparently a couple of combinations or so in the channel. They, they had a, a special Set, set of boats ch uh, patrolling the channel to pick up survivors and uh, we, we entered the, this, this area uh, which was covered by anti-aircraft fire. So, uh, did, it, sorry, did it resemble what's on the screen now, roughly? Turn around. Yes. <laughs> you can't see much, can you? Really? Anyway, we, uh, we got to the point where we've got to pull <coughs> off. And I say pull off, that's to release the glider. The glider pilot releases the glider. The towing aircraft, which I call a tug, flies on with the cable on. And the rear gunner in the back end of the <coughs> Sterling has a release lever to dis dis disengage the cable. We used to bring them back when we were training because they were quite expensive things to produce anyway. I don't think they'd bothered about bringing them back from the, from the op. I think they were in too big a hurry for that. <coughs> and we released. And Des said to me, shall we dive it? So, phew, we certainly did. <coughs> we got down, the, the, normal, the normal flying speed was 110 miles an hour. The glider would land at about 45 to 50 miles an hour. When I pulled out of the dive, which was when we could see the ground and we knew we were going to pull out, otherwise we'd hit it. We were doing 170, well it was off the clock, the clock read up to, a, the, the clock read 160 and the, the needle had gone beyond 160. So we were off the clock really. Anyway, we made, we, we were all right, we did a, we did a decent, uh, say it myself, 
a bounce landing. Dad said, shall we bounce it? And we did. And we bounced it on, because we were going to, if we didn't bounce it, we were going to land in the river Isis or Isil. Isis. We just touched the ground and bounced and the nose struck the little far bank of the river and broke off. Now the Mark II glider, as you've probably seen, is the nose was a door with the seats and everything in it. So that was a natural break point. <clears throat> so it just broke the hinges and the locks on it and the nose, complete with us in it, rolled at about <laughs> 100 and something miles an hour into the field. Left, left the rest sticking up on the, the and when it stopped rolling, we, we, were, we released our, and we fell on our heads because we're actually not, not right way up. And as we ran back, we didn't walk, by the way. We didn't walk. We ran. I didn't see another glider on the ground. I, I, I find it difficult. I see these pictures. I, I never saw another glider on the ground when we were there. It's psychological. All I could see was what we were doing in front of us. And as we approached our glider, the jeep was being driven out with the trailer attached and the men clambered on it. And on the top of the, the jeep itself, a flat bed, there was a tarpaulin and then you got netting on it. The idea of the netting was you get your fingers in it to get hold of. So we leapt on quickly onto the jeep. There was a gate on this field and we just, the driver just drove straight at it. I think it just drove the great gate down. And we turned into a little lane, hanging, up, hanging on like grim death to, the, to this, uh, the, the, the grip points. And a figure emerged from the hedgerow on the right. He's, he's lucky he didn't get shot. And he was a brigadier by rank, a padre. <laughs> so we were all right. We had the, we had the right venerable bishop of whatever with us on the jeep and we made it and we got disembarked from the <laughs> got off the, the jeep Bob and I well Bob wasn't with me Des Ryan who I was with and we walked with our packs on our backs and said cheerio we never saw the others again they went off and the, the army went ahead we went to the battalion headquarters and we had on our backs what was called an entrenching tool. It sounds rude, but it's, it's, a, half, it's a shovel that bends in half, a spade really, it bends in half and you strap it to your back and when you, when you want to dig a trench, you straighten it up and dig the trench. And we got to the brigade headquarters, we go in, there was nobody else there. I, I, I couldn't believe it. There was nobody. To t Des said, well, we better, get, we better get dug in. And we went out and there was a slit trench on the left and there was a couple of blokes in the slit, slit trench. So we dug, I never dug a tr slit trench, never mind about with this tool entrenching. But between us, we, we, managed to dig, we managed to dig deep enough to get our heads below the ground, I can tell you. <laughs> and uh, so we, we, we stayed in the trench and we... And over the, overhead, one of the latest German t twin jet Messerschmitt, I think it was a 263, 262, 262, 262. flew over. Yeah. And uh, uh, someone said, oh, look, there's a... And, and as he was doing it, the, we were being air supplied. We'd, we'd landed and Halifaxes were coming in, resupplying, dropping, with the bomb doors open, dropping, very low, hedge hopping. A Halifax actually crashed in, blew up alongside us. In the stream, one of the tugs, in, one of the gliders about four or five in front of us, a Hamilcar, was hit and disappeared. Bits fell out of the sky in front of us before we actually released. You couldn't tell what they were. You know you see the films of, of the Battle of Britain where they, the fighters are shooting down another fighter. This was a, this was a, a Halif, Hamilcar on tow, disappeared blown to pieces. So we, we got off, pulled out, and we're running back down the field and the jeep's coming out. And we get there and the brigadier emerges and he's come down on a parachute. <coughs> he's not come down in a glider. So he says, any lift, boys? 
So we clambered aboard. We stayed in the slit trench till the following morning. And by which time there was a bit of order coming in around us. So they'd got a compound up for prisoners of war. And would you believe it, this fellow that, that had flown the 262 was brought in as a prisoner. It, it bailed out over the zone and uh, went to the prisoner compound. And so we managed, our, we got our K rations out, which was the packed stuff, chocolate and sandwiches and stuff. Well, not sandwiches, but biscuits. And we had literally nothing to eat for, for several days, but the, we went into the German houses within the zone and we went, didn't go short of food. The, the, as, we were, as we left the Jeep, as it drove on, we walked through the field up to the, to the house, on, the first house we came to, on the, in the outskirts of Hamming-Kelne itself, which was the little village in the middle of the, of the zone, the drop zone. The German families were in the slit trenches in their back gardens. It was a sad sight, really, and I, I feel very emotional when I think about it because I felt sorry for them. They were the civilians out of the houses. And not only that, but we were all rifling their food. And we did, because we'd got nothing to eat. And we'd won and they'd lost. And we stayed there for three days, at least. And then we marched back to a place called Helmond, or Ruhrmond, I never remember which, in Holland. <coughs> but we didn't march to there, we would march over the river, over one of the bridges that they'd built. Pontoon bridges were built during the night, the first night of the, of the landing. And on the Sunday morning, we saw the first tank, British tank, come driving into the, into the zone. And we, we knew by then that we were safe. We were brought back home. We came back and we recruited here at Fairford, ready to go on another op, which didn't come off because the Japs packed in. That's about it, gentlemen. The details, if you want any, you're welcome to ask questions. Thank you very much, Ken. Are there any questions at all? Any questions. All right. But oh. not, not, I don't, I don't fly. I've got a group of friends that say a certain birthday will treat you to a trip. So I go up in a 125 Cessna and I get hands on, do a few. <clears throat> I've actually flown over Tewksbury doing a roll and a loop and, uh, <laughs> and still turn with the instructor. And uh, yeah, it's great fun. Love it. So you say you were RAF? Yes. Because, of course, we have a very close affinity with gliders at Stoke Orchard. Yes. Uh, because the, I've actually been there. That's right. Well, it was the Army Flying Corps that yes. first started flying gliders. Yes. Uh, we had Hotspurs that were yes. stationed at Stoke Orchard. They came up from um, Western Sivermere because the runway got waterlogged. So they had to come up from there to, to Stoke Orchard. And a lot of the pilots that flew uh, gliders in Sicily and right. in Arnhem yeah. were trained in Stoke Orchard. Yeah. Uh, and sadly, after Arnhem, there were so many of the Army Flying Corps that were killed there, uh, the RAF had to take over flying gliders. That's right. That's exactly how it happened. And in fact, um, Bob Shepard was killed, my co-pilot with, with an Army pilot, uh, on the Rhine crossing. And uh, I've actually been there. I've seen his memorial at Nijmegen. I've been to Remagen. I've been to... I've been to um, Edinburgh Castle and seen his memorial there. Um, no known grave. Thank you for such a wonderful talk. Uh, we really did appreciate it. And more to the point, I think a lot of us appreciated what your generation did. And I don't think you get the credit, or your generation gets the credit, that it deserves. Um, I'm really, really pleased to hear what you had to say tonight. And uh, we thank you very much for coming. Well, I've got two grandsons. <laughs> and they're, they're, tall, they're as tall as you are as well. And uh, uh, I'm very lucky because I've, I've had a wonderful life, a wonderful wife. I was married 56, 56 years. And uh, it was part of life. It was just an episode in my life, really. 
I'm jolly glad I took part in it because I wanted to. I, as a boy, I wanted to. I was so frightened by the radio broadcasts of, that came in every day from Luxembourg of the of the what was going on in Germany and and all that. And I was well aware of the, of the risk and what 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 it meant to the family. And I, I suffered the bombing in Leicester. But Leicester was bombed. It wasn't just London that was bombed. Well, thank you again. Okay. Thank you.